my brother priests, deacons, religious ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be here with you this evening. I'm grateful for the invitation to address you as the recently installed 11th Bishop of La Crosse. It is still startling to me to hear my name mentioned in the Eucharistic prayer or see my picture in sacristies across the diocese. I suspect it takes some time for the imposter syndrome to wear off. I thank God I rely on the church's judgment and not my own. Otherwise, I might question my legitimacy as the local ordinary. When I spoke with Father Chuck and later Father Edgar about tonight's topic for reflection, they said simply, Mary. While that's a rather broad landscape, it is a subject that warms my heart and I suspect yours as well. Who doesn't delight in meditating on the joys, sorrows, and privileges of our mother? Our Lady is by divine decree the mother of the faithful. Her tender care for us as we traverse the highways and byways of life is with the sympathy and love of one who has walked that path too, as one who has gazed upon the child in the manger, upon the man on the cross, on the one who became for our sake, the one who is called risen. Mary is the mother not of a human nature, but of a person, an enfleshed soul, the mother of a child who would be revealed as Lord. She who is the mother of the child Jesus, of the one crucified on the Friday called Good, is found to be the mother of him who is revealed as God, revealed definitively and for all time to us in the resurrection, found to be by divine decree mother of all God's children. While it is not unusual for a child to be sentimentally attached to one's mother, Mary is simply different from any other creature born or yet to be born. What separates Mary is a singular fact. It is what makes her preeminent among even the angels and saints. First, by far, of any child born of man. She is, and from which all the privileges of Mary flow, mother of God. No, no other creature can lay claim to such a truth. No other creature enjoys the privileges of she who pondered what the greeting of an angel foretold, what it was like to bear the one who is the very face of the Father for nine months, who swaddled and suckled the newborn whom the wise bore gifts and the humble did homage. She walked with him beginning in the temple, knowing that he who was gift would be a gift rejected. She saw him set out for his destiny in Jerusalem having spent 30 years at the school of Nazareth. She heard him preach and speak of the Father's plan. She met his marred and spittle-laden face on the road to Calvary. She stood at his cross. When the frightened had fled, she received her mission, her mission from the lips of her dying son to behold her children. She received his broken body taken down from the cross and prepared it for burial. She was there when the stone was rolled across the entrance and traumatized and grief-stricken 
return home alone. She pondered his life and death for days, yet believed. And then just as he had promised, he met her in the pre-dawn light of the first day. Filled once again with the joy of the Holy Spirit, receiving the promised bounty of her faith, proclaiming with wondrous rapture that he is truly risen, her baby, her son, her savior was truly risen. Mary was not simply a vessel of the incarnation. Mary is the mother of a new day, a new horizon, a new vision for all mankind to which her son's sacrifice, initiated with his blood, nailing death and futility to a tree. Every disciple, man and woman, adult and child, is invited to life in a new key, as Pope St. John Paul II would say. Life whose dimension far exceeds that which the creation begun with Adam and Eve could foretell. The fathers of the Second Vatican Council wrote that man is the only creature God has willed for himself. This is true of all mankind, but preeminently so of the mother of God. God decreed from all time that the virgin would be prepared, that his son might inaugurate in his own flesh the new age of love, the age of the Father. Every creature that would believe in the Son might not just have forgiveness of sin, might not just have new life, but might have the life of the Holy Trinity, the life in communion of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Trinitarian life, divine life. If such wonder might be conferred on ordinary creatures, then it should be little wonder the marvels the Lord would bestow on she who is his disciple, his daughter, and before else, mother of God. Pope St. Paul VI wrote in his apostolic ex exhortation, Marialis Cultus, that in the Virgin Mary, everything is relative to Christ and dependent upon him. Mary's gifts flow from Christ's open side, just as all the gifts we receive from his passion come from his one and perfect sacrifice. Mary received, though, a gift which is unrepeatable. She was God's mother. No other creature can claim this. No other disciple can, by grace or attainment, approach this singular privilege. This should be self-evident, yet sadly so many of the church's children, so many of our separated brethren, allow polemic, to obscure what God has done in Mary and what he desires to do in each of us. So many obscure the dignity and truth that the new horizon in Christ has begun and is meant to be brought to fruition with the assistance of his church, with firstly Mary, and then all disciples who would pick up their cross and follow after. As Pope St. Paul VI wrote, Mary is crafted by the Holy Spirit into a new creation. Each of us who are saved by baptism are as well. Perhaps and most definitely, the privileges Mary has as a new creation answer the objections of some reformed theologians that Mary represented in the Catholic Church is more godlike than like a creature. Perhaps they don't know that the very point 
of Christ's mission was not just to set us free from the slavery of sin and death, but even more wondrously, to make us by grace like he who is God by nature. I had the grace of studying Blessed Columba Marmion, an Irish monk and spiritual giant of the early 20th century. He repeatedly wrote that all Mary's privileges, all the privileges of the elect too, rest upon the mystery of the incarnation. That all of Christ's mysteries from his incarnation to his passion and to his ascension are our mysteries as well. I often think that one of the leveling aspects of the Reformation is a chronic under amazement of what God desires to do in us through the life death and resurrection of his son, a failure to grasp the enormity of the incarnation. There is a concern for the uniqueness of Christ's person and mission such that any participation in God's plan to reestablish all creation in Jesus Christ is thought to denigrate Christ's singular mission. Scripture and tradition do not support such an unwarranted concern, but rather the very opposite is true. The self-gift of Christ is meant to be joined to his self-gift, our pattern of discipleship. We are meant to, as Archbishop Alan Vignaran wrote in his pastoral letter, Unleash the Gospel, we are meant to reproduce the self-gift of Christ in our own lives. Like Mary, every disciple's identity and mission flows from and is representative of Christ and his mission. Discipleship flows not from the heart of the disciple, but from Christ and his mission, from his open side, flowing into the lives of all believers. Christians are partakers of the mystery. They are bearers of the mystery. They are witnesses of the mystery. It's not about Mary. It's not about me and you. It's about Jesus who shows us the face of the Father, who incarnates the Father's love. A horizontal Christianity without the vertical dimension is not Christianity at all. Without the vertical dimension, Christianity is shorn of the power of the cross, of the one perfect sacrifice of the God-man, Jesus Christ. It is Jesus and his obedience that allows for and sets the stage for a new obedience to the Father, an obedience torn asunder by our parents in the garden and restored and elevated by the only begotten Son. Mary in her motherhood is the first disciple of Jesus. She is the one who pondered in her heart all that the Almighty was doing in her. Her yes and her own obedience to God's plan is the pattern and way for every disciple's obedience. Blessed Columba Marmion wrote that obedience is the sine qua non of a successful discipleship for the monk and thus for every Christian disciple. Mary's willingness to say yes to the Father's plan anticipating the yes of her son, who was sent by the Father. Our Lady's obedience caught up in her fiat gave way for the obedience in fiat of the multitude of disciples to follow. She who pondered in her heart the mystery of Christ is the exemplar for the church, 
for discipleship itself, for obedient, obediential love of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Pope Paul VI wrote in his apostolic exhortation that Mary is intrinsic to the celebration of the Mass. Mary is present at every Mass, standing as she did at the foot of the cross. She, in her obedience and receptivity, represents the Church as its most august mother, bearing in her flesh the tabernacle of the Most High and entering before other creatures into the mystery of Christ's sacrifice an offering of perfect obedience to the Father's plan. I am firmly convinced that if Eucharistic renewal is to move forward in our local church and in the universal church, then a renewed appreciation and devotion to the person of Our Lady and her motherhood must take hold. Pope Paul VI saw this from afar when he wrote, but the church taught by the Holy Spirit and benefiting from centuries of experience recognizes devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary has a great pastoral effectiveness and constitutes a force for renewing Christian living. Two things are necessary for renewal, my dear brothers. Our gaze has to move from ourselves to Christ. We need to cultivate all authentic discipleship where we too ponder the mysteries of Christ in our hearts. We need to pray to contemplate the son with the mother. We need a Marian spirit of obedience and receptivity to take hold and grow in our hearts. We need to ask the mother of God to meditate with us on Christ, that we might adore him in that great Christological prayer, as Pope St. John Paul called it, the Holy Rosary. We must ask her to share with us her faith and her love of Jesus asking her to intercede before us with the Holy Spirit, that we too might be crafted as our mother Mary was. God bless you.